an introduction to acoustics. Um, and I suppose really this session is for people who are uh, maybe new to the subject, uh, maybe new to the fan industry. Um, uh, obviously, if you're if you're a bit more experienced, um, then maybe you could treat this as a, a sort of a, a bit of a refresher. Um, sound is just one of the important performance um, parameters um, of the equipment that we design, manufacture um, and supply. But from my experience, um, acoustics, sound or noise, however you want to determine it, is um, is probably one of those topics that people are a little bit less comfortable or confident about. Um, so hopefully in this session, um, it will give you a bit of a, an improved understanding and then a bit more um, confidence about it. OK, so slight technical difficulties there. Um, right, so in the presentation, um, I'm going to cover the following um, topics. So uh, a little bit about um, sound propagation, a little bit about human human hearing, um, why we use the units we do. Um, there's a little bit on um, a very practical side of um, addition of decibels. Um, I'm going to talk a bit a bit um, about the corrections you can make for um, for distance um, away from a source, which is uh, very commonly done. Um, a little bit about different acoustic environments, what we call free field environments, and what we call semi reverberant or or truly reverberant spaces. And a, a little bit on um, a weighting and other sort of noise quality criteria. And the last bit is just a, just a bit an overview of um, noise control. So. There's quite a few things to go through. Uh, they're all fairly light touch. It's just a sort of an introduction, a bit of an overview um, um, of, of the subject. Um, and, and as Edit said, if you've got any um, questions, please put those in the chat. And if it's appropriate, I'll, I'll try and answer those um, as we go along. Um, if not, there'll certainly be some time at the end and I'll do my best to, to answer any questions that you have on the things I've covered or anything else that sort of related to the subject um, that you'd like to ask. So why is the study of uh, um, acoustics important? So in terms of pure physics, acoustics, sound, noise, um, that they're all really the same, um, the same thing. Um, sound generally is considered to be, you know, um, the vibrations that travel through air or another um, medium um, to a person's ear. Uh, and quite often noise is normally determined as sort of what is unwanted sound. OK, but in terms of physics, yeah, they're all the same thing. Um, and if you like, acoustics is the overriding name for the subject, but that includes noise um, and vibration because the two are very closely linked. So why is it important? So I suppose the first one there is that uh, if the noise is, is is excessive or higher than it should be, um, it can lead to a loss of um, concentration. So for us in our daily lives, that's probably not such a um, an important thing. But if you're a, a brain surgeon or a surgeon working on somebody, you wouldn't want to be disturbed by the noise from the, the ventilation system. So it's important that the noise level is appropriate and it's appropriate for the activity that you're trying to um, to undertake. If the levels get higher, it can lead to a, a breakdown of communication. So you can't hear other people. So an example there would be, say you're in an underground environment, say a tunnel or a, or a metro, um, and there's safety advice being given out, um, but the ventilation system's on and it's so loud that you can't hear that, that, that critical or vital information. OK, so it's important that it's still allows you to make sensible um, communication. And if the level continues to go higher, yes, it can start to um, impair or damage um, your hearing. OK, so what is hearing and, and what is noise? So sound itself is just fluctuations um, in air pressure. Um, close to the area around our ears. And, and you can think of it as a, as a sort of a series of, of pressure waves. OK, so in my very simple example here, we've got a, a loudspeaker going across to someone's ear and you can see we've got this um, compressions in the air um, um, as the sound moves through any compressible medium. OK, so sound can travel through through air very easily, travel through water. Uh, a much higher speed and it can travel through solids okay but then normally it's converted into um, into vibration so during that propagation phase as the sound is moving those waves can be reflected so that's what an echo is that's 
sound being reflected back. It can be refracted, which means it can it can bend around corners um, um, or it can be attenuated. So it can actually start to be attenuated by the air. So over large distances, that sound energy is actually absorbed into the um, into the air particles or the medium that it's in. So a little bit of biology here. I'm not going to go into too much um, <laughs> detail with this. So this is a, a drawing of the human ear. Um, you can see you can consider it being broken down into three separate elements. So we have the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. So the outer ear is the thing that most of us consider to be our ear, which is the the, the bit of skin on on the side of your head, and and, and there's a, a hole there, and that then feeds the sound down. Um, the ear canal, ear canal, canal, channel, um, up to um, what's called the eardrum, okay, which is a, a very thin layer um, of skin. That's then connected in the um, middle ear via a series of three bones, which take those um, fluctuations in air pressure, so the movement of that effectively like a diaphragm, converts it into mechanical movement, um, and then that is then transmitted into the inner ear um, with the, the device, which is called the, um, the cochlea, which is the, the sense organ, which looks a bit like a snail, um, which is actually a fluid filled um, organ. Um, and, and inside that organ, um, that movement in air pressure, which is converted into mechanical movement, is then converted into vibrations in the fluid. Inside the cochlea is a whole series of very sensitive hair cells, um, and they are effectively frequency dependent. So they get excited by the different um, frequency. That's then converting to electrical signal, which is then conducted to the brain. And then that's what we sense um, 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 as hearing. So probably one of the more um, um, important aspects here um, is that this, this central area of the middle ear is actually um, filled with air. It's also linked to your, um, to your mouth via this um, tube called the eustachian tube, which allows for the air pressure um, to be equalised. So if you've ever been up in a plane, um, which is something we haven't done for a while these days, um, and you, you maybe feel a bit of pressure on your ears, um, what's happening there is that the air pressure on the outside of the ear um, in this channel is different to the air pressure inside and it's causing a sort of physical pressure on the eardrum. So what you have to do is you have to swallow um, or chew a sweet um, and that and then it just allows the air pressure um, in the middle ear to, to equalise. So it's very important that that, that happens. Okay. So how does noise damage the hearing? So like most um, elements of evolution or uh, um, biology, the, the ear is an incredibly complicated um, device, but it's also quite sensitive. So effectively, um, as um, as you work it too hard, so if you subject yourself to too much noise, you, you start to damage those very delicate sense organs, um, those, those very delicate hairs within the cochlea. So if you subject yourself to high levels of noise over a reasonable period of time, you will start to damage your hearing um, and it's irreversible. So um, they don't recover um, and they don't repair. So once they're gone, they're gone. Um, it's a bit like a similar thing. I suppose you could think about your um, your sight. You know, as you get older, um, your sight starts to deteriorate and there's a very similar um, process with, with human hearing. Um, but that can be speeded up if you have subjected yourself to um, excessive levels of noise. So you can also have what's called a temporary um, shift in your hearing, a temporary threshold shift. So this is where um, you've subjected yourself to a, a high level of noise. Say you've gone to a concert um, and some people might say that they've come out and it feels like their, their ears are ringing um, and they don't hear um, correctly for, for a number of hours, but then normally by the next day um, it has sort of returned back to normal. Um, but again, if you do that on a regular basis, um, it could lead to permanent hearing loss. So when I started my career um, um, in acoustics some 30 years ago, maybe um, one of the first jobs I did was measuring noise levels um, um, in, in the factory to make sure that the, the noise for people working in the factory wasn't excessive um, to affect their hearing. Now, that's probably less common these days because we don't have so many factories, um, 
but you get exactly the same effect um, if you use your headphones or your earphones and you have your music on too loud. Your ear doesn't recognize the difference between industrial noise um, and you know, just listening to music. If you have it too loud, um, you can cause uh, uh, damage um, to your hearing. Okay. So human hearing covers a, um, it really truly actually is a, an incredible range, um, both in the level, which leads us on to the, the different units we use for sound um, and the frequency range. Okay, so the frequency range is between 20 hertz up to 16,000 hertz. Um, so when you're young, you have a, a, a sort of a, a much broader range, particularly at the high frequency. Um, as you get older, um, you start to lose that, that high frequency sensitivity. Okay, it's just a, a natural process. And in terms of the, um, the different levels, um, that, that we can hear. So we are detecting small changes in pressure uh, uh, above and below atmospheric pressure. The minimum that we can detect is 20 micro pascals, so 20 millionths of a pascal, up to 200 million micro pascals um, or 200 pascals, which is um, what's called the threshold of um, pain. So you certainly know when you're subjected to that level. So on the chart here, um, we're really saying is that from, from zero dB, which is you know, effectively the, the threshold of hearing, um, we go through this range of rusting leaves, a whisper, um, you know, moderate rainfall, 50 dB, maybe a car going by 70, helicopter, let's say 20 meters away, 100, um, up to a police siren or jet engine, and maybe the level of um, fireworks. So you can see the levels there get progressively higher. Um, but what, what we've done there is, um, is a way of trying to represent this very large spread um, of different pressures. So we detect um, changes in actual pressure, but the scale was changed to decibels. And, and the reason being is that the scale is so immense, um, it's quite difficult to have any meaningful numbers if you talk about pascals. And also the human sensation of hearing is much more closely aligned with the logarithmic scale. So what was done is, is that the actual threshold of hearing, uh, this 20 micropascals, which uses the baseline, and the actual pressure is divided by this threshold, log times 20, and that became the level in, um, in decibels. Okay, so we use, we tend to use the decibel scale um, in Europe anyway, and, and uh, there are alternative scales um, that can be used, sons and fons, which are sometimes used in the US, but the decibel has definitely become the, um, the sort of uh, the unit of choice, okay? Um, um, but it does lead to some implications about how you manipulate that and how you use those um, numbers because they are based around um, decibels. So as I said, if you subject yourself to high levels of noise, you can start to um, impact your hearing. Um, and it's generally recognized or um, um, accepted that a level of around 80 dBA um, for an eight hour day is sort of considered to be the upper limit of what is safe. Um, anything above that, and you're gonna start to impact um, or, or damage your hearing. Now, unfortunately, the, the process of, of damaging your hearing can take a very long period of time. Um, so normally it can be 10, 20, 30 years of subjecting yourself to those levels um, that you start to have an impact on your hearing. But that's normally made worse because when you are 20, 30 years older, your natural hearing has also started to deteriorate. So those two things tend to happen at the same time. Uh, and the real issue with it is, is that the damage generally bits is around the frequencies where we speak. So you tend to lose the sensitivity in the frequencies that we speak at. So it um, makes it very difficult um, to, to, to hear speech. Now, in our modern lives, um, we're not particularly used to having um, very low noise levels. Um, so uh, your hearing, you can't turn off. Um, it's, it's always on um, by evolution. Um, it's, it's there um, and probably particularly if you live in an urban area, you're not particularly used to having um, very quiet levels of noise. Now, normally when we give this presentation, um, you'd be at our um, UK 
manufacturing facility in Colchester. Uh, we have an R&D facility and within that R&D facility, um, we have a specialized room, which is called an anechoic chamber. Um, and this room is very, very quiet. So it's a, a concrete constructed room. So it stops noise breaking in. So it's uh, it prevents noise coming into the room, but also is a room that has a very high level of absorption. So um, I don't know if you can see it from this photo, but on the wall, um, there are these very deep um, foam wedges, which are about um, 600 millimeters deep, um, and they effectively stop any reflections um, in that room. So acoustically, it's a very dead room. Um, and if, if you work in there, some people find it a little bit uncomfortable because it is so quiet, um, because there's no noise breaking in and there's no um, reflections or echoes in there. Um, you can start to hear like your um, your heart pumping and the blood rushing through your actually through your ears. So it is such a low level. So some people do find it a little bit um, disconcerting. OK. So I'm just going to go through some of the, um, the different terminology um, that we use in acoustics. And, and I suppose in this section that, that there's really two main ones, which I think it's important to understand the difference. So the first one is um, a sound pressure level. OK, sometimes um, it could be called SPL or DB or DBA, although they're not strictly correct. Um, the correct ISO terminology is LP, so it's a level in pressure. OK, but sound pressure is is what we hear and it's what we as humans react to. So that's 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 what we that's our sensation of sound. But the sound pressure level um, is dependent on the on the strength of the source. So how low how low the source is, but it's also equally important um, on the environment um, in which it's located um, and really how far away we are from that source. So if you have a a, a radio or, and it's on very loud um, and you're, you're one meter away um, you then walk 100 meters away um, it seems a lot quieter but, but it's still at the same level it's still producing the same level of noise at source but the environment the distance away um, has a huge impact um, on that noise level and sound pressure levels are generally the results of acoustic calculations so normally you do calculations because what we're interested in is the noise that's in the space that's going to be occupied by people, whether that be a quiet office, a conference room, a school classroom, a gymnasium, whatever it may be. It's it's we want to work out what the result noise level is going to be um, in that space. In, in, in our example, you know, from the ventilation system that's operating. So the second parameter, which is probably um, from my point of view, the, the more useful or more, more meaningful for a piece of equipment is its sound power level. So this is the amount of sound energy that a particular piece of equipment or device will create. OK, um, probably the best analogy that I can come up with is if you think of it like a, um, an electric heater. So when you buy an electric heater, um, it probably has a rating in terms of kilowatts. So it's a two kilowatt heater. It doesn't say that this heater gives you 20 degrees C at two meters away. It tells you what energy um, it produces and the temperature that you would get from that depends on the environment that, that you put it in. So it's very similar or it's the same for for sound power level. So in our example, we manufacture fans. Fans are a, um, a great source um, of, of noise OK, because they're doing a particular job and they create a certain amount of noise. The important thing about sound power um, is it's an absolute value or property um, of the equipment and it doesn't change um, unless you change um, the working conditions of the equipment. So one of our fans for a, for a given duty, you know, a given size and speed, it will produce a certain amount of sound power. Okay? And sound power generally and should be the basis of all kinds of acoustic calculations. So if you're doing any predictions, um, either to atmosphere or predictions of noise levels inside buildings, sound power should be the starting point for those calculations. So I said we manufacture fans, um, and just to give you some idea of the, of the range of, of noise levels, 
um, that, that you might expect. So I picked what I could find was probably the quietest fan, which is a 315 millimeter um, JM fan running at 900 RPM, has an overall sound power of a level of 56, um, going up to um, what we use on tunnels and metros kind of projects, which is a large axial 2.8 meter, probably running at 1000 RPM, um, and that's 130 um, dB. Um, and in fact, we have offered fans um, which are over 140. Um, so as you can see, there's a there's a, a, a large range of those, and it's all dependent on what that that piece of equipment is doing um, in terms of its performance. Okay. The good thing about our products is, is that the the data for those um, will be available, um, um, and those products, the noise levels for our products, are based on actual tests. So. Um, it's based on fully based on test data, so it at least gives you a a reliable start point um, for for any of those calculations um, that need to be done. So I'm going to talk a bit about the um, addition of decibels. Um, it might be something that you did at um, school, probably something you don't do in normal life. Um, but I've got two examples here, um, and all I'm going to do is just really explain um, the basis of the calculation behind that. So the first example there, I've got, I've got 100 decibels plus 100 decibels. Uh, it's 103. It's not 200. It's 103. Um, and the second example, we've got 100 decibels plus 90 decibels, and that's only 100. So it doesn't seem to make any um, any difference. So how you do it on a on a calculator, um, because there are um, because the values are already stated in um, in decibels, which is a bell times ten, you have to divide each number by ten. You then have to find the the antilog of those numbers. Um, you then add them together, which is what we're doing here. Um, when you have the result, um, log the answer, and then you multiply it by ten again. Okay, now. Um, when I started my career um, in acoustics, um, we didn't particularly have desktop computers, um, and you could have done this on a calculator, but generally we did it by um, by hand manually, um, mainly because it was actually um, it's a lot quicker. Uh, and there's a very simple rule of thumb um, that you can use, which is actually surprisingly accurate. Um, and what you do is is you look at the difference between the two levels you want to add. And then depending on that difference, you then apply a correction to the larger of those two numbers. OK, so if the difference is 0 or 1, you add 3 dB to the larger number. If the difference is 2 or 3, you add 2 dB to the larger. If the difference is between 4 and 9, you just add 1 dB. And the difference is greater than 10, you don't have to add anything to the larger number. So in our first example, we had 100 plus 100, difference of 0 plus 3. 103 and the second example we had 90 plus 100 the difference is 10 so we add 0 to the larger number which gives us 100. So I'm just going to go for a, um, a, a, an example and a little bit more detail it's really just to show how we um, how we get from the data that we present so um, I've got a uh, example here of an 800 millimeter um, um, Woods fan running at um, 975 RPM, um, and the selector has given us um, two, two separate pieces of information. It's given us an overall level of 85 um, dB, um, and it's given us this these eight octave bands. So in noise control, um, uh, it's quite difficult to do noise control with a single number. Um, it doesn't really provide enough detail, um, particularly on the characteristics um, of the sound. So it's very common, international standard, that you provide the data in eight octave bands. Um, not everyone does. Sometimes they might only provide seven or six octave bands, um, but we present our data in these eight octave bands. And all I'm going to show is just basically the very simple relationship between those two. So we've got eight octave bands, um, and I'm just going to combine them um, from eight to four, four to two, two to one, to give me um, the overall number. So 
The first example here is I've got 63 hertz and 125. I've got 79 and 77. That's a difference of two. Looking at my chart, a difference of two means I add two to the larger number. Okay. Second one here, 77, 76, difference of one. Difference of one is plus three to the larger. So 77 plus three is 80. Um, 1K and 2K, I've got a difference of four, which means I need to add one to larger. So 73 plus one gives 74. And 67, 62, difference of five. Uh, look at my table as plus one to the larger. 67 plus one is 68. Okay. And then we just need to follow this process again. So we've gone from our eight octave bands, we've combined it into four, and we can now combine the four into two. So 81 to 80, difference of one. Looking at our table, difference of one is plus three to the larger, 81 plus three is 84. And difference between 74 and 68 is six. Looking at our table, that's plus one to the larger, 75 plus one is 75. And the last one there, uh, I've got 84, um, 75, difference of nine. So that's plus one to the larger, 84 plus one is 85. So now we can see there are 85 dB, same power, ties up with our eight octave bands, okay? And that's how those are, are combined um, to give you that single figure. And, and if you wanted an A-weighted value or something, you, know, you, you can add additional um, corrections onto this to do other calculations. So it's just a very simple way of just showing how we convert the octave band data, which is required for the kind of acoustic design into the overall level um, for the fan, which is just a summation of all that energy. One of the most common corrections that are made um, to sound power levels is a correction for distance away from the source. OK, um, and I just really wanted to just explain um, how that's done. Um, it's based on a very simple um, premise um, or idea. So the idea is, is that um, you, you have to assume that the sound power um, of any piece of equipment effectively is a, is a, is a point. Um, in, um, if you like, in space. So all the energy is, is in one, it's at one point. And then we think about moving away from that point at a distance. And what we are thinking about is, is that energy being spread out over a sphere, um, a sphere of increasing diameter. OK, so there's a few assumptions in there. But the main assumption is, is that what we're really thinking about is the intensity um, of the energy and intensity um, is watts, if you like, per meter squared. So we know the watts because that's our that's our sound power, that's our starting point. And all we're now thinking about is the, the surface area of the sphere. So we're taking the same energy, but we're just spreading it out over um, a greater area, um, which then reduces the intensity. Okay. So a bit of simple maths. Surface area of a sphere is four pi r squared. Um, if you do that for one meter. Yeah, so four pi r squared is 12 and a half square meters. Um, and because this is acoustics, you just log that, times it by 10, um, and that gives you 11 dB. So for the first meter away from the source, you get an 11 dB reduction, which is what we're showing in this table here. OK, now if you double the distance, so you're now at two meters, OK, using the formula 4 pi r squared, 4 pi is fixed. The r is a squared term, um, so the surface area increases by 4. So it's 4 times the surface area every time you double the distance. The log of 4 times 10 is 6, so you get a 6 dB change for every time you double the distance. OK, so 1 meter is 11 and then 2 meters will be 17, so it's a 6 dB reduction. Now, spherical propagation um, assumes that there are, you know, it's completely unrestricted for the energy to, um, um, to, to move out from the source. And, and quite common, um, we actually do the calculations under what's called hemispherical propagation. So this assumes like a solid floor, but the sound is then, is, is then able to emanate above that um, in a hemisphere. 
So it's exactly the same calculation. It's just that the, um, the surface area of a hemisphere is half of a sphere. Um, and again, log of two times 10 is three. So there's a three dB difference. So you get three dB less um, for, each, for each meter or each distance away from the source. But you still get a six dB for doubling the distance because you've got an R squared term. Um, every time you double that, that gives you a square um, uh, and that number squared log times 10 is, is four. So you, you get a, um, a, sorry, that number is, is four times. So you log it, it's six. So you get a six dB reduction every time you double that distance from that initial 11 dB for one meter for spherical and eight dB for hemispherical propagation. So all those first set of calculations, um, this idea of the sound emanating out and being completely unrestricted, um, that, that's what we would call or determine free field. Um, so effectively, it's free from reflections. And I've got a little bit of a, um, a calculation later, just a, a very simple comparison um, between a free field calc. The alternative to that is the sound is contained within a room. OK, so any calculations into a room inside a building um, they're going into a what we would call a semi reverberant or reverberant space. OK, um, and this example here really shows that you know, the sound is is bouncing around the room. Every time the sound hits a surface, um, it is either absorbed or reflected. OK, and it, and it keeps bouncing around the room. So this is where the surfaces of the room um, have a big impact on the noise level inside the room because it will determine how many times or how many reflections there are. So in a typical office, and I'm sat in my one now, um, offices tend to have a couple of surfaces um, which are absorptive. So you can have a, a carpet, which is a, a good source of um, absorption of sound, and you'd normally have ceiling tiles, um, and, and they are one of the higher um, absorbing materials that you'd have in an office and they're specifically designed to provide that extra um, noise reduction so the space is not too too reverberant and like i said if we were doing this presentation and you were um, actually at our facility you know we, we'd go into the um, piano coat chamber um, and, and you would go into a, a you know, what is a, an extremely dead space you know, um, you know no, no reflections at all okay so this is where it's important to understand um, uh, the space of which you're trying to calculate the noise level because it has a big impact on what level you will actually achieve um, in that room. Okay, so just onto my um, fairly simple example here. Um, so uh, I've got a fictitious um, source, it's a loudspeaker, um, 80 dB um, sound power level, LW, and, and I'm going to calculate it at three meters. Okay, so so sound pressure level going to be at my my receptor. So I'm going to do this calculation in two ways. So I'm going to do one as a free field space and one as a, a much more reverberant or an enclosed space. So in my first example here, um, um, I've still got my three meters distance. I'm, I'm in a, a free field, a lovely field. Um, and using the formula from earlier, three meters, if I assume spherical propagation, three meters gives me minus 21 dB. So my 80, take 21, becomes 59. So it wouldn't be unreasonable to, to assume that we would be able to measure a level of 59 dB um, at, at the receptor or the listener. Now, the only big assumption with this is that it assumes that the source is what we call omnidirectional, which means it uh, produces sound equally um, in, in all directions, OK? So a loudspeaker is a sort of reasonable on directional source. Um, the important thing with fans is, is they're um, not particularly, um, mainly because for axial fans, they tend to be, um, you have the impeller contained within a casing. Um, so they are much more what we call directional. So effectively, you know, a lot of the sound comes out in the same direction um, um, as the airflow. It's also important to realise that with a fan, doesn't matter which direction the airflow is going, the noise from the fan travels equally um, out of either side of the fan. Okay. Now there is a slight difference between the inlet and outlet, 
but yeah, the noise travels in both directions. Okay, so you have to attenuate both sides of the equipment. So my second example here, um, I'm at the same distance, I'm still at three meters. So I've done my free field calculation. So I've got 59, but I've now done my reverberant calculation. So I've made an assessment based on the size of the room, um, the acoustic environment, you know, how reflective it is. And that's only given me an eight dB reduction. So I've now got 72, okay? So my direct sound is the 59. My reflected or reverberant sound is 72, which means if I add those together, so the difference is greater than 10, so I'll just take the larger number. So I'm now getting 72 um, in that space. I'm still at three meters away from the source. The source hasn't changed its level. So the source is exactly the same, but it's, it's a lot noisier or a lot higher noise level. And that's all to do with the space that it's in. So it's, it's really important to make sure that um, if you're doing those calculations, it's important to know what the environment is, is that, that, that you're calculating into. Because in this case, it's had a 13 dB um, difference, um, which is a, yeah, a huge difference. Um, and you'd be quite disappointed if you thought you were going to get 59 and you're actually measuring 72. Um, one of the things I spoke about earlier a little bit was the, um, uh, was the human ear. Um, our hearing um, is noise sensitive, so we don't have um, linear hearing at all. Um, so human hearing over time has evolved primarily to be the most sensitive um, between 500 hertz and 4000 hertz um, and they are generally the frequencies is that we communicate at so they are effectively what you might call the speech frequencies so human hearing is, is well attuned to, to pick up um, speech we're not particularly good um, at detecting low frequency sound so in my example here uh, with this chart um, i've got frequency across the bottom um, and uh, dB or noise level up the side. So the yellow line represents effectively like um, linear hearing. So that's the sort of thing that a, um, a standable meter would detect. So it just it just measures everything equally. But the blue line represents human perception of sound. So we're not very good um, at hearing low frequency sound. We don't communicate at those frequencies and therefore our hearing is, is not attuned to it. So it is quite a common technique um, for some manufacturers to present their data um, as A weighted um, because it gives, generally gives you a lower noise level. So it can look a lot better, but it doesn't make any difference um, whether you present it as, as linear, as A weighted, it still produces the same amount of sound energy. Um, it's just how it's presented. So again, you need to be careful and you need to, to make sure always that you're comparing like with like. You know similar parameters you know sound power to sound power um, dba to dba or db to db um, so it's uh, it can be easy to be um, misled if i put that politely um, with the information that's um that's provided okay and that's just a that's just a table showing those those corrections so you can see you know it's quite quite big 26 and 16 dB at 63 and 125 Hertz so it's quite a big reduction um, for, for human perception uh, one of the other common um, things that's, that's done for inside buildings so uh, DBA um, is generally I suppose accepted as um, what's used for environmental noise so generally outside of buildings a weighting I would say is, uh, is majority used it's not always used inside um, so you might have an a weighting criteria inside um, or you could have an alternative um, so the example I've got here is a, is a noise criteria curve um, it, it's actually very similar um, to an a weighting it's just presented in a, a in a slightly separate a slightly different way it's actually a, a table with a whole series of curves um, and what you would do in this case is that you would you, know, you would design your system to meet this noise level and then when it was commissioned um, you would go in um, you would measure the noise um, and then you basically you would plot what you measured on this chart so the the line in red is really just showing what we've what we've measured um, after it's all been commissioned okay um, and in this example um, we'd say oh yes we've met this nr sorry this nc40 criteria um, and what it is, it's it's where the red line is the highest point that it crosses any of those curves. So um, in this situation, um, it meets our 
NC40. So we'd say, yes, that's fine. Um, it, it meets the criteria. Um, and that would be a, a fairly typical criteria, say, for a, for a quiet office space. Okay. There is an alternative to that, which is the um, NR rating, uh, which is very similar. Excuse me. The, um, the NC is um, based on a, on a US standard, and the NR is, a, um, is an ISO, uh, which would be like European um, standard. But it's, it's a very similar. Um, it's a bit more extensive. Uh, has a much higher range. It goes all the way up to 135 or even higher. Um, and the NR rating is the value um, that is achieved at 1000 hertz. So NR40 is 40 dB um, at 1000 hertz, but you still have to go for the same process of, of, of plotting um, what's been measured or what's been predicted um, against that, um, that criteria. Okay. So we're just uh, just finishing up really. Um, the last bit here is just a little bit about um, um, about noise control. Um, so we've got an example here. Um, so this could be our building. So we've got our fan on the roof. OK, um, the typical approach for um, the noise control, and in this case, I mean the sizing of silences, is basically to start with the sound power of the fan. Um, you then calculate how much noise comes down the system and goes into this room. Um, so there are losses uh, as the um, the noise moves down the system. So for bends and ductwork, and then you make an assessment of how much of that energy goes into that room, the size of the room, the acoustic characteristics of the room, the distance away from the from the grill, um, and that then gives you your noise level. Um, you can then compare that calculated noise level to the criteria, and the difference between those two is how much additional attenuation you need to put in the system. OK, but it's not the only type of noise. So that, that's what we would call airborne noise going through the ductwork. Um, but there are other areas where you could have issues. You could have noise from the outside, the other side of the fan, maybe breaking back in through a window into the building. Um, you can have noise breaking out of the ductwork, which is called breakout noise from the ductwork. Um, and you can even have noise, which is basically the vibration of the equipment, which then passes into the structure, um, goes through the concrete floor, comes down the wall, comes through here, and then comes out um, into the space below. So it's important to just follow some, some fairly basic um, good practice instructions or guidelines there to try and limit those other, those other paths. OK, so in terms of you know, normal acoustic design for a ventilation system, um, what you do is you start with your with your fan, your sound power level. You do those calculations um, into the into the receiving room, and compare that to your criteria. And the excess, what the difference needs to be taken up with um, what we call a silencer or a, or an attenuator. Okay, um, and it's good practice to to isolate the fan from the structure, which means mounting the fan on anti-vibration mounts and to fit um, a flexible connection um, on the inlet um, and the outlet of the fan to, to separate it from the structure. Okay. Um, noise does have a habit of um, um, finding the, um, the weakest link. So if, if there's any um, weaknesses in the system, the noise will generally find its way um, through that. But then normally you just, you just have to correct that. Um, um, and that's how you can then achieve your, um, your noise level. It's also important in HVAC systems to, to make sure that the velocity is designed to the appropriate level. And the reason for that is, is that if the velocity is excessive, um, what you can get is effectively velocity regenerated noise. So although you've attenuated it with an attenuator, if it goes for a, a grill or diffuser or a damper and the velocity is too high, it will create noise um, due to the vortices. Um, of the air going over that static element um, and that can increase the noise level um, and therefore means that you you may not meet the criteria um, in the room and it's very important to understand that the um, the, the room you're designing for so if you design for one room thinking it has lots of um, soft furnishings or lots of absorption and it turns out the room doesn't have that then you're going to get a higher noise level in that room so it's important to understand that the room that you're you're calculating into so 
just the last little bit here about um, different types of silencers. Um, so we obviously make round things, fans, um, um, and we have a range of round silencers. So this is a this is the simplest type. This is a straight through silencer. Um, I'll give you about seven to ten dBA for a one D length. Um, and I suppose the main benefit of this kind of silencer is, is there's no impact on performance of the fan. In fact, it probably it probably helps it a little bit. But uh, yeah, there's no obstruction, so there's no loss. Um, all, all you get is a reduction in noise. Um, you don't get any loss in performance. If you're looking for a little bit higher performance, um, you can use what's called a potted or for us a C-type silencer. So this gives you um, a higher reduction. So rather than seven to ten. We're now talking about 12 to 15, so it's it's higher. But of course, this this central element here um, does cause a restriction to the airflow. OK, and it has a, it's a K factor of about 0.5. So you're going to get a pressure drop um, associated with that. Um, it's fairly simple to um, to work that out. Um, there's, there's a table uh, where you can read off your um, airflow um, and you just you go up to, to, to cross the different diameter of silencer. So in this example, if we say 10 meters cubed for a one meter silencer, it's around 50 pascals. OK, and if you calculate it, that's what it comes out with a, um, a K factor of 0.5 based on the um, velocity pressure. So again, it's giving you a high performance, but there's always a trade off. The higher the performance, generally the higher the pressure drop. Now, if you need much higher performance um, and a cylindrical silencer um, isn't adequate um, to meet your noise level, um, then you have to go to a to a rectangular or splitter type silencer. So this is a, a sort of different arrangement, um, uh, rectangular or square. Uh, and in here we have a whole series of what we call splitters, uh, which are made of um, acoustic media, um, so rock wall or fiberglass. And in between those, there'll be airways. Um, to allow the air to get through, um, much higher performance, um, much higher pressure drop can do. But also the, the big difference there is you have to convert from a round fan um, to a rectangular or square duct. So you're going to need to have um, you know, transition duct work um, to convert um, at a reasonable angle. Um, and you need to expand out to a reasonable size um, to keep the, um, the pressure drop down and to keep that velocity down through those um, splitter elements. Because again, if the velocity is too high, um, you get a compromise in the performance. You know, the science starts to generate noise um, more than it's attenuating. OK, so just um, a bit of a whistle stop. So just in summary, um, I've talked a bit about sound propagation, um, human hearing, why we use um, decibels, because it's, it's too difficult to use um, pressure, so it's converted to decibels. We did a little bit of addition decibels, talked about the effect of distance and just simply how that's calculated based on a um, you know, reduction in the intensity of the sound. Um, different environments, a little bit of A weighting um, and NC um, noise quality assessments and a very little bit about um, noise control. So uh, I think the last thing I would, would want to say is that the, the important thing with um, from my point of view with acoustics is is to make sure when you're looking at equipment that you're comparing like for like units, sound power to sound power, sound pressure to sound pressure, um, and the same units dB to dB, not dBA, um, because it's quite easy for acousticians to uh, confuse the data to make it look better than it is. Um, and one of the benefits that um, that the Woods product range has is that uh, it's extensively tested um, and the data that's in the fan selector or catalogue is actually based on real um, test data. So it gives you some comfort that the data is um, is accurate for your start point. And that's all I've got.